man, if you met one. I'm walking around outside. Why would you say you didn't have the damn bag when you had it? You know you can't give a sworn statement and lie on it. Why would you do that, Matthew? On April 15th, 2016, Matthew Boynton, a 20-year-old officer in the Griffin PD, dialed 911. Can you please dispatch a unit out to my uh, location? Give me a reference uh, to my wife. Um, I left the location. I'm, I'm back and around on Carver Road now. I'll be back there in about two minutes. Uh, she's having suicidal thoughts. My kids are at home with her, so I'm trying to hurry up and get back there. I'm driving. She just said that she's been experiencing suicidal thoughts right now. She told me to take care of the boys. So I'm trying to hurry up and get back home just to make sure that nothing's going to happen to them. Any weapons inside the house? Um, just my service weapons. He claimed that his wife, Jessica, was about to die. He rushed to their residence and heard two gunshots and waited outside until the authorities arrived. The officers rushed to the location and barged into the Boynton house at Ashford Place on Ashford Way. Police department! Police department! Hang on, sweetie, okay? She's trying to get up. Can we get her out to the bedroom? Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Jessica, the 19-year-old mother of two young boys, was found with a head injury. But what she lost that night was not her life, but instead her complete memory of that particular evening. And so, the truth seemed to be veiled. Matthew's neighbor had heard an argument from the Boynton house that evening. Loud voices concluded with two gunshots before Matthew rushed out of the house. Since Matthew's grandfather was the then sheriff of Spalding County and one of the investigators in the incident of Jessica's shooting, no charges were leveled against Matthew for attempted murder. Instead, the case was ruled as self-harm, even though self-harm cases do not involve two shots. In December 2016, eight months after the incident, Jessica filed a complaint alleging theft of her bag and belongings by Matthew. He denied this accusation and signed a statement to that effect. However, months later, Matthew's new girlfriend turned in the bag mentioned by Jessica, exposing Matthew's false testimony. For this, he was interrogated by Sergeant John Hayes and Lieutenant Karen Yancey. This interrogation room has one deviation from normalcy. Both parties, the interrogator and the subject, are police officers. Would the police officers try to save one of their own or subject him to harsher police techniques? Let's find out. All right, Matt, I'm just gonna start off by letting you know that, that I am not conducting an, an internal investigation on you, okay? okay. So Gary is not implied. Okay. okay, I want you to understand that, all right? Okay. All right, Gary does not apply to this incident, okay? Can you fully explain what that I understand part of it, but just She's gonna read she's gonna read you Miranda. Okay. So I just wanna let you know that we're not I'm not conducting I know I do IAs, but this yeah. is not an IA, this is a reference to a criminal investigation, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Both parties are aware of the tactics used during interrogations. How will that affect the dynamics? Here, Sergeant Hayes begins by mentioning that the interrogation will proceed based on Miranda warnings and not Garrity warning. Miranda warnings are given to suspects in criminal investigations and emphasize the right to remain silent and the right to an attorney. 
Garrity warnings, on the other hand, are part of the internal investigation for public employees and can have job-related consequences, but there can be no criminal proceedings based on what comes up during the interrogation. If Matthew admits to wrongdoing in this questioning, he might be facing criminal charges. All right. Well, this is a way, uh, Miranda waiver before we read everybody before we talk to them. Mm-hmm. And that you know that myself, Kay Yancey, and Jay Hayes are officers with the Griffin Police Department. And we're going to advise you that you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that? Mm-hmm. It says, I understand my rights and having these rights in mind, I'm now willing to talk about items that belong to Jessica. Uh, I've not been threatened. I've not been promised anything. I've not been forced in any way to answer any questions or make any statements. Okay? If you want to talk to us, just sign right there. All right. What's that in reference to? It's in reference to, you remember the um, statement you wrote me about Jessica saying you took items from the house? Yeah, that computer. Yeah. That's what it's going to be in reference to. Okay. So what's the time? 17.22. How old are you, Matthew? 21. <coughs> what's your current address? Uh, one Bay Road. Spell that for me. Ellen. Is that Griffin? Yes, ma'am. It's Galley. 224. Alright. And what's the last grade you completed in school? I uh, graduated high school. Okay. Yeah, college. The seating arrangement in the interrogation room, with Matthew at the center surrounded by interrogators, creates a triangular setup that influences power dynamics. As the lieutenant goes over the initial details, Matthew sits with his fist clenched, indicating anxiety or the desire to exert control. Although the sergeant is silent, his presence in the corner with assumed authority heavily influences the atmosphere in the room. When Lieutenant Yancey starts to pen down details, Matthew can be seen yawning, an action popularly attributed with boredom or fatigue, but it may also be a coping mechanism for stress or anxiety. So Jessica came in, she filed a report. Um... I talked to you about it. Uh, you wrote a statement saying you didn't have any of her items. Um, right. The report specifically said her retainer and stuff like that and clothes. Okay. Um, do you know anything about where her clothes or retainer might have been? Not like I told her before, the only thing that we might have had would have been in that white trailer, and my stepdad has not mentioned anything else being in there. And we gave everything back that we had because she had put some stuff in like a, uh, it's like a little foot chase thing. Mm-hmm. You open it up, it's got two little boxes. I think we used to use it for like diapers and stuff now, but I mean, everything that she had that I knew of was gone. I got rid of everything I knew of. And you got rid of a house, so. Yeah, either give back to her or her family came back and got it. You know, like she had a big kitchen table and some other stuff that her Aunt Kathy and Uncle Tim had come and got. Um, just different. I think my stepdad actually took a whole bunch of stuff over to her grandparents' house at 2464 East Milner mm-hmm. in Pike, which is like right by my parents' house. Okay. So, when did you move to Lumay Road? Uh, that would be sometime in March. March? Mm-hmm. Uh, through the course of that move, did you find anything that belonged to her at that no. point? No, because if I would have, I would have turned it over to her. Because I had no need to keep her stuff. The only thing I had at that point was that computer. I mean, you had talked about that and gave it back to her. Because mm-hmm. she could let her talk to Bird. Okay. So, do you recognize that bag? Yes, yeah, that bag that Jessica let me use to put all my gym stuff in when we used to be together. Okay. So, when's the last time you saw that bag? Uh, it's been a long time. Like I said, I, when I used to work out at, um, there's two gyms in Thomaston. I don't remember the name of it. I used that one, and I had a uh, gray Nike bag I used to work out in. Um, so I interchange my stuff like protein drinks, um, powder shakes, like pre-workout, uh, workout shorts, pants, shoes, whatever. I put it in that bag or my Nike bag. So when's the last time you saw that bag? I mean, I, it's been a while. I don't, I don't know an exact date. I don't know. Um, I think my stepdad 
he he had it in the I think the white trailer and that that's been a while and he brought it but I haven't been through it or anything um, he put it in my storage put it in my storage thing in my house which is like when you pull in the driveway mm -hmm. it's a little storage thing on the right you open the door and it's got all my stuff in there I declared that some of it out recently that was tossed in there but I was in there with a bunch of my stuff like a brown tub I used to keep in my old patrol car with gym mm -hmm. stuff in it and work stuff there are some techniques commonly used for most people sitting on the suspect chair. One of these techniques is scenario exploration. In this technique, detectives let suspects create inconsistent and fabricated narratives, then use these discrepancies against them in later stages of the interrogation to assess their responses and challenge inconsistencies. Also, did you notice the name of Jessica has been mentioned several times already, but it seems like the interrogators are hell-bent on sticking to the bag? They're tiptoeing around the major fact that Jessica intended to leave Matthew that evening and had packed her bag with the same motive before she was shot. And this bag was later found in the possession of Matthew. The line of questioning along with the entire purpose of this interrogation looks like a deliberate attempt at omitting the primary crime and whitewashing the entire case. But specifically for Matthew, he comes off as someone who gives extra details. If you've watched our previous episodes, you might be aware that sharing excessive details can be a potential sign of lying. Would that be the utility room, my carport room, at your new house? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I keep, like, or I, well, I keep stuff in that, and I keep stuff in, like, what's considered an office and left the back of my house. Mm -hmm. I just toss it over the rest of my job. <clears throat> that's just old gym bag. All right, Matthew. Look, let's see, let's see, fold. let's see, fold. Known you a long time. Yes, sir. This bag, you saw it moving when you moved from your apartment to the main road. I had it in the and, and And your stepdad, and Wendell. Wendell saw it. And another female saw it. All right? Okay. At the house, in the apartments, just for nothing. When you um, moved from the park. When I when I moved, like I said, I had all my stuff in the white trailer. Man, that's, that's not that's not what I'm asking. When y'all were in the process of moving, and you moved into the house that you're at now, your residence, did you or did you not see this bag? Yes, sir. It was in my storage room in the in the garage. All right. Now, why would I be holding a picture of this bag? I guess because Jessica brought it into you. Why would Jessica have it if you had it at your house? Um, I don't know. I guess somebody got it from my garage or <clears> my shed. Who would have got it? Um, there's a couple of people. Okay. I don't know. All right. Exactly who. Okay. As Matthew is answering to Lieutenant Yancey, Sergeant Hayes, who has been silent so far, coughs and leans in, displaying the ultimate power pose. It is his cue to try and break through the defensive wall made by Matthew. In an immediate response to his authority, a sudden attentiveness can be seen in Matthew's body language. He straightens his spine, changes the angle of how he was seated, and resettles into his chair. What looks like a mischievous kid at the principal's office situation is a direct cause and effect of authority and sycophancy, and this can be seen here. The sergeant's opening statement, known you a long time, is the second tactic often used during a cop-to-cop -cop interrogation, where an already established rapport can be exploited in order to create a sense of familiarity and expectation. From there, the interrogation swiftly transits into the second stage, where Matthew is confronted with the final card, the picture of the bag. The interrogators will now be challenging the inconsistency in Matthew's initial explanation. Before we move any further, it's important to understand some details about Matthew's personality. As a police officer, Matthew loves his job, but is not known for leniency or morality. He was brought up by his sheriff grandfather, who was involved in the investigation and cover-up of the shooting of Jessica. All three women he dated had the same complaints about him, that he was controlling and intimidating. At home, Matthew was restricting his wife from meeting her family. Isolating a spouse from their family is a classic tactic that reduces external influences and helps maintain control over the spouse. 
He also shared details of their arguments and fabricated lies about Jessica with his colleagues at work. Finally, Matthew is part of a major cover-up and hiding evidence. He's used to lying and getting away with the misuse of his position. And inside that bag, there were numerous contents inside of it. And one of those is this right here. You know what this is? It's like Jessica's old retainer thing mm -hmm. and she had them wear together. Right. The bag was completely filled with female clothes. And this is one photo of it. That's not yours. No. No. Right? No, sir. Okay. That's not yours. No, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Who does that belong to? This guy, Jessica's name, wants to be Jessica's retainer thing. If it was in that, if it was in this right here, where would that have been at? I had all of her stuff in it and locked. What would it have been at? It would have been in my the garage thing like I could sit in. Which is where? Which is at my house. Which is at your house? Yes, sir. Did you buy that for Jessica? I don't recall. I don't think I did. Because she had... I think her grandparents did. Because she had retainers before she met you, right? Before y'all got married, right? I believe so. So that would make it whose property? Uh, hers. Not yours, right? Right. Yes, sir. Whose bag is that? Uh, Jessica's. And the contents in the bag? It's got all of her stuff in it. So why would you not have brought that to us when you noticed, when you saw the bag at moving? Sarge, I promise I've not been through that bag. The last time I used Matthew, that bag I was for this. I didn't ask you that, Matthew. Listen to me, buddy. I <laughs> I understand what you're saying, it's just because I should have brought it up here. You know, Next all time. things, and I don't know anything about your other issue, but all things involved in reference to this case, all the going around, the statement that you wrote, where's the statement at? The statement that you wrote. The same statement. I didn't read the, I don't know what the statement said, what did it say? It's just very brief. I uh, gave Jessica a property like I gave her a computer and everything. Right. Yes, sir. Whose is this bag? It's Jessica's. I just I didn't think, think about it because I used it as a gym bag and she let me use it. I understand what you're saying. Matthew, a police officer. Yes, sir. I understand. You're a police officer, Matthew. You know we are held to a higher standard than anybody else. I understand. You know people don't 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 expect us to make mistakes, and they don't realize we're human. I understand that. Yes, you sir. understand that. Shouldn't it's more about it. <sighs> the sergeant is seen employing another technique called an ethical appeal. This aims to make use of the halo effect around police officers. The halo effect refers to how, regardless of their conduct, a police officer is generally seen as a good person who is protecting society. This perception is often built on false image projection, a phenomenon that can also be a part of gaslighting. People who often gaslight others may exhibit a trophy complex, which refers to a mindset where individuals seek external validation or status symbols as trophies to boost their self-esteem. Sergeant Hayes is aware that Matthew admires being a police officer, and now he's using that to make Matthew open up. This is another tactic that works well in cop-to-cop -cop interrogation. You work out a lot, don't you? You stay in shape. You're in good shape, right? Chanting. You have two bags that you swap your stuff in between, right? Yeah, I don't have the other one anymore. So this would have been your only gym bag. So how would you have not knew the contents of the bag? If this was your gym bag, man. I have no excuse. I, like you said, I should have should have thought about it and brought it up here. That's like having two cars. Yes, sir. If you use two cars and you get in the other one and it's out of gas, then you not know it's out of gas. You're right. Because you used two cars, right? Yes, sir. If you were using this, being slap full, and I say it was slap full, I mean, it was... I want to say, just just a guess, there were probably 30 or 40 articles of clothing in it. You would have known. I mean, it almost looked like 
when whoever packed this bag can pack this bag to move. Matthew Boynton, January 9, 2017. I was advised to complete a statement on a previous day by Lieutenant Yancey. Jessica Lester Dash Boynton's property was already previously returned to her by my stepdad, Charles McDaniel Jr. Shortly after Jessica got out of this hospital, uh, the dining room table, along with other items, were picked up by Kathy Zellner for Jessica. The remaining items, such as hope chest, clothing, and other miscellaneous items, returned to Jessica. I do not have any other items of Jessica's. This is Matthew Boynton. Is that your statement? Yes, sir. What's that, Matthew? That's Jessica's bag. Jessica's retainer. You understand you didn't buy that? I understand. That does not make it community property. I understand. That makes it her property. Yes, sir. That you're in possession of. Yes, sir. I understand. In a display of both official mentorship and personal dynamics, the sergeant adopts a paternalistic tone, spoon-feeding Matthew with answers as if speaking to a child. As for Matthew, he's been employing two kinds of lies here to defend himself, omission and commission. Omission lies involve withholding or intentionally leaving out certain details or information to create a misleading impression. On the other hand, commission lies involve actively providing false information and fabricating details. The bag was turned into us. We have possession of the bag. Yes, sir. We have evidence that says it came out of your storage room. Is that true? Yes, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say? No, sir. I said I was just done with my part. Of do you believe? Do you believe that statement to be accurate and true? Not now. Did you believe it then? No, sir. You need water or something right there? You sure? Yes, sir. I got some right here. Thank you. All right. I'll be right back. When presented with evidence, some people try to make excuses and stories and end up giving out some incriminating information that implicates them. This is verbal leakage. However, in this scenario, this confession doesn't seem accidental. We cannot be sure if it's planned or thought out, but we can say it's a resignation to the situation because Matthew doesn't seem to have any other option, so it seems like he's setting up his camp here. The sergeant stands up and leaves the room, and the other detective follows. This has not given any kind of closure to Matthew, leaving him to stew with his confession and his train of thought regarding potential consequences. The line of questions has disturbed him and has led to contradictory emotions surfacing. The act of over-grooming, such as repeatedly adjusting clothing or touching one's face, can serve as self-soothing behavior and as a coping mechanism to manage stress and maintain a sense of control. 
Additionally, looking at his hands is often an indication that an analysis is in process. Guilt is catching up. He's acknowledging that he messed up and he knows he does not have a job anymore. Sorry, man. I had to smoke a cigarette. You're good. Man, you get one. I'm walking around outside. Why would you say you didn't have the damn bag when you had it? You know you can't give a sworn statement and lie on it. I'm not sorry. Why would you do that, Matthew? It was a bag, man. It wasn't. It's not like it was. Talk to me, man. I mean, help me understand. I'm sorry, I swear. That was that was hard to believe. I didn't think about that bag. Otherwise, I wouldn't have broke. I wouldn't broke. I said, "Hold on, little T. I got something. Let me go get it." I swear, I wouldn't have done that because I've got two kids, three and one. I went and jumped outside over a bag. If I'm telling you, sorry. If I would have thought about it then, I would have said something. But you knew you had I the did. bag. And I, did you not I know you had the bag? I'm sorry. I, my mind's right. I don't. I don't know. I didn't. I should have turned it in. But not only because I'm a cop, because I should have, because it was just because even if she let me use it, it was the right so. thing to do, man. I'm clear. Yes, sir. But why didn't you turn the bag in when you damn moved? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking then. Did you think he was going to get in trouble if you turned it in late? I, I guess. I don't know what I was going through. In my mind. What do you think should happen now? No, that's probably going to happen. No, that's not what I asked you. So what do you think should happen? My kids are fucking daddy's boys, man. If I would have thought about it, I would have done it. Of all, of all the stuff that you, you see about you, you know if you were in possession of something that belonged to her, you know you should have, you could have brought it to me. You know I'm going to do the right thing, you know I have to do the right thing. I would have took care of it, I would have gotten the bag back to her. But when you knew you had the bag and you didn't do anything about it, man, you put me in a situation where I ain't got, I don't have any other choice. I'm clear. I'm clear. There's no excuse for it. Here. I know it's got that on there. Um, it's, just, it's so hard. Like, well, I, I love working here. I know you, know, you do. And I, I'm so, I asked you, I, mean, I was so scared to come to work every day. Why? Because every time I did. You know, it was always uh, eleven seventy nine or ten twenty two to uh, forty two. Come up here. I mean, it's always something. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I thought if I brought it up here, I was gonna get fired and whatever. I, mean, I don't know. I'm so young. And stupid. But Matthew, you know, doing the right thing, regardless, it doesn't matter. If you do the right thing, you can live with yourself. There are three statements from the sergeant that are important here. I would have done the right thing. I would have taken care of it. I don't have a choice. It's too late for Matthew or the sergeant to make things right. This might be the first consequence Matthew will face. We don't usually find young people saying, I'm so young, to defend themselves or as a cause of grievance with themselves. Is this an indication that Matthew is manipulating the sergeant's mentorship here? We can't be sure. Matthew is breaking down and speaking of his kids. He clearly is going through a rough patch here, but his primary concern as of now is limited to him losing the job he so admires, and not about the fact that he attempted murdering someone. His own wife, no less. So we can say that we do see remorse, but it's for not lying better, and for failing to see what was coming, but not for failing to exhibit a sense of morality in his actions. Um, I mean, that's why I was raised. But you, you know that. You know that you have to do the right thing. And when you found, even if, if you found the bag... You should have said, hey, hey, LT, hey, Sar, hey, whoever. I got something, man. Stop for a minute and talk to me. I don't know what I was thinking then. I don't know if it's because I was scared. I mean, I, I, come, I told you, I come to work every day scared. Now. There's no excuse. I'm not trying to make one for myself. I 
Yeah, I know I'm obviously not employed anymore. It's just like the only thing I can think about now is my kids, man. My, my kids. I'm just, daddy's boys. You know, the baby is actually. I took him in like he's my own. And I'm not setting a good example right now. I always try to show my kids what is right. But you know, when you when you swear an oath, we swear that we're going to uphold the law. Yes, sir. Regardless, and you know you can't lie. Tell you can't lie in an investigation. You know that. I don't know what I was thinking. Like I said, I don't know if I was scared or what. I don't know what was going to my mind then. Does that make it right? No, it doesn't. I know this is everything I've ever worked for, like out the door. My main concern is my kids, man, because I've got, I've got primary custody over them, and this is gonna set me back if I get locked up for this. I want to go down the scene every other weekend. And she's not gonna take care of them like she's supposed to. Like she's supposed to put them on her insurance. But, I had to do that. But Matthew, if you did what you were supposed to do, we would not be here in this situation. You think I want to be here? No, sir. I would be rather be anywhere else than be here. Clear. But if you had done what you were supposed to do, we would not even have to be having this conversation. You would have to worry about it. Yes, sir. But you know that we have to do, we have to do the right thing. We have to do what people pay us to do. You know that. You know that, especially with me and Lieutenant Yancey, you've known us a long time. Yeah. I, just, I don't want to let lose the, the primary custody of my kids. Like, I know, I mean, no matter where I go now, I'm not really going to get a good job now, but like, the main focus is my kids, man. Life is not over with. Everything happens for a reason. Just hang tight, okay? The case started with limited information, minimal preliminary records, and little evidence making it complex. Humans have a system in place that makes them believe what is easier to believe. This tendency is known as the truth default theory. People have been accepting Matthew's version of events even though they don't quite add up, a common occurrence with frequent manipulators like him. To use this tactic, people like Matthew first dehumanize their subjects in their mind, something Jessica experienced closely. They label them as extra sensitive, crazy, or with an overactive imagination, all tactics that fall in this category. Such a collection of tactics is called gaslighting trespass. It is like a toolbox that can be used to manipulate narratives in reality. Matthew cherry-picked them to avoid justice and to deceive not just individuals but the entire system from time to time. The department prioritized its reputation over ensuring accountability for an individual, particularly a police officer, who attempted murder and sought to conceal the crime. On July 28, 2017, Matthew was arrested, removed from the police department, and charged with two felonies, filing a false statement and violating his oath of office. However, on July 11, 2018, the grand jury decided not to indict Boynton on the charges of making a false statement and violation of oath by public office. He was cleared of both felonies. Shortly after the case, Matthew resettled in a nearby city and joined the police department there as well. The irony lies in Jessica facing questions about her sanity and being gaslit before the shooting. However, after the incident and her subsequent coma, she had no recollection of the significant injustice done to her that night. Matthew, in a sense, remained part of the ultimate gaslighting of Jessica. Despite psychologists assessing her mental health shortly after the incident and stating a 0% chance of Jessica attempting to take her own life, she was still labeled as a bad mother and an unstable person. Losing his job for a few months was the only consequence Matthew faced, and the only justice Jessica got. Given the context, we invite you to share your thoughts and insights on this case. Do you think investigators already had an idea about the attempted murder even before the bag was found by Matthew's girlfriend? Do you think he has kept up his ways in the next police department? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you'd like us to cover any specific case, please drop your suggestions. Also remember to like, comment, and subscribe so that we can keep covering such cases. Until next time, stay safe.